Hello, Hello Daniel. Hi, Bill. How's it going? I'm good. How are you? Not too bad. I'm, uh, uh, I speak to you from the, this nondescript hotel in Chicago. They can see, <laughs> our, our viewers can see some very drab uh, wallpaper and uh, generic uh, painting you behind me. You've been punished. Some, You're on assignment. Pet, yeah, that's right. I'm on assignment in Chicago, and, uh, and here I am from the hotel room. Uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the bloggers folks who might not be familiar with you? I'm Dan Foster. I'm news editor at uh, National Review Online. Excellent. And uh, for those who don't know me, I'm Bill Scher with Campaign for America's Future at ourfuture.org, also liberaloasis.com, which is the home of the Liberal Oasis radio show. And my guest this week will be my former bloggingheads.tv partner, Matt Lewis, talking about 2010. Uh, but, Daniel, you were uh, in the uh, blogosphere spotlight this week after this uh, local story in Tennessee of a a man whose whose house burned down while the uh, nearby local fire department watched yeah. because he did not pay a seventy five dollar fire protection fee to the neighboring town. His his rural town was too small to have its own fire department, uh, and this got a lot of attention on the left as an example of a. Uh, uh, libertarianism gone awry, uh, and it sparked a lot of debate on the right on that same topic, and you were right in the middle of that. Yeah, well, you know, I, I saw this item, I guess, I forget if it was Monday or Tuesday, but I saw this item, I think, on Think Progress, and, you know, I, I noted it, and what ended up happening was kind of a funny thing. This big discussion on the corner on our blog started about it, in which I was in the minority. Uh, my position was that the fire department acted wrongly, in short, uh, not putting out this fire. But an interesting thing happened, which was that I noted this item, and my first take on it was, yes, this looks bad for libertarianism. Uh, it's it's clearly a failure. But, you know, my, my argument started as kind of a moral argument that in this particular case, uh, the fire department had responded to keep the fire from spreading to a fee payer who lived next door to Mr. Cranick, whose house burned down. And I said, under those circumstances, you've got a guy standing with a hose in front of a burning house. Uh, it's almost just a, a moral requirement that something be done about it. And it was predicated on the idea that, as Mr. Krennic, the, 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 I guess the victim in this situation, had said, he would pay for the cost of putting out the fire after the fact. But anyway, I started this in sort of a moral way. But what ended up happening is over the next few days, I kind of thought my way through it. And, and, and it, it was a very interesting conversation, kind of back and forth on the right side of the blogosphere, reading what people thought about it on the left, uh, the sort of general outrage that was their response, talking with my colleagues here, talking with some smart libertarians, trading emails, reading a ton of, you know, reader email. I, I think I got 400 plus reader emails on this topic. And so uh, I was kind of able to think my way uh, through it and what, what went wrong here and, and, and how, how it could be ameliorated. And, uh, well, you know, well, we'll walk me through. Your, your initial argument was what? Well, I thought that, you know, in, the, in, the, in this circumstance, so there's a 70, think about like insurance, there's a $75 a year fee for people who live outside the city limits uh, uh, of South Fulton, Tennessee, which is a rural town in a rural county with a diffuse population in western Tennessee. And, and the people inside the city limits get fire protection via their property taxes, and the people outside can opt in to a $75 a year service. Uh, to get coverage. And Mr. Cranick, whose house burned down, didn't opt in. And he said, in a way that was not helpful to his cause, that he assumed that they would come and put the fire out, even though he hadn't paid his fee. And what actually ended up happening was he called the fire department. They didn't respond. Only when his neighbor was worried about his property did the fire department respond. And then they infamously watched Mr. Cranick's house burn to the ground. So my point was that you have here in this situation a human being in distress and you have at your disposal the means to help said human being, and you have a reasonable expectation to be compensated for any costs you incur to helping this human being. So uh, that, that was my original argument for why the fire should have been put out by these fire. After, you, sort of after you said level. that, there were a number of National Review colleagues of yours criticizing you. I think one of the toughest was General Goldberg, yeah. who said... Uh, uh, here's the more important part of the story. Letting the house burn, while I admit sad, will probably save more houses over the long haul. I know that if I opted out of the program before, I'd be more likely to opt in now. No solace to the homeowner, 
but an important lesson for compassionate conservatives like her own Dan Foster. Zing! Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, he hit me where it hurts. Did that, uh, <laughs> did that give you a bit of a gut check that you had to reassess your initial thought? Well, you know, I, I even said in my original post that I have no problem with this kind of opt-in government. I mean, fire departments were private throughout most of the 19th century in most areas of the country. And in this case, if the if it really were, you know, one house per 10 square miles and so, or some really diffuse population, it was hard to get government services around, then a pure opt-in would make sense. But at the end of the day, as I said, I sort of thought my way through what to think about this in the ensuing days. And I think at the end of the day, talking to some smart libertarians and kind of coming to a consensus on it, the solution here is that this shouldn't have been an opt-in service, that it, it just can't, that kind of pay to spray, as I dubbed it, can't really work in, in a population where there are spillover effects. I mean, fire doesn't respect property boundaries. And uh, so so I, I don't think I'm that well, far that, that off. That's how you, you changed your view. It, it's not It's not necessarily that I changed my view, but I, I don't think I was ever that far off from my colleagues. I think that the argument I was, they were making a policy argument, that this is a policy that was sensible, that Mr. Krennic had every opportunity to protect himself at low cost. He did not, and that to reward him for his selfishness uh, would have created a free rider problem, created a moral hazard. And I think that's valid as, insofar as it goes, but I guess I would say that the mistake my colleagues were making was thinking about it as designing a policy. As I said in my post, we're not designing the policy. The policy's in place. We're dropped in the middle of the situation. We're standing in front of a burning house with a hose. That's, you know, so, so I mean, that, that's where I think the conversation begins and, and, and ends for me. But I, I'm not that far away from them on, on the virtues of opt-in government in plenty of cases. I just don't know that fire is one of them. Fire protection is one of them. Is this really, really dry? I can't tell. Is this really boring? <laughs> I, I don't think so. I mean, this was a, a, you know, a big story on the left. I think the, the, yeah. uh, the victim of the fire was on, uh, was on Keith Olbermann's count. He was. And, and, um, to, and much to my dismay, as a uh, worst person in the world in good standing, I am a, I am a one-time worst person in the world, <laughs> much to my dismay, Keith Olbermann paid me a compliment the other night. I found out, I'm, I'm, I'm very I found out about that. it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm very. I found out about it from a reader and any it's credibility. A letter for the rest of your career. <laughs> exactly. I, I'm updating my resume. <laughs> but but the, now um, there was also focus on the left about what Glenn Beck had to say about it. Uh, yeah. He said the other day, uh, "Here's the thing. There, there's just those that are just on raw feeling are not going to understand." If you go on to compassion, compassion, and pa compassion, or well, they should have put it out, what's the fire department for? If you don't pay the $75, then that hurts the fire department. They can't use those resources, and you'd be sponging off your neighbor's resources. Uh, this is the kind of stuff that's going to have to happen, or we're going to have to have these kinds of things. Yeah. Uh, and Digby reacted to that, saying, don't just let when multimillionaires lecture you about how we're going to have to have these sorts of things. Beck has an entourage and a bevy of servants we can pay to stand in a circle and urinate on his house if it catches fire if necessary. Um, this hideous conversation is so indicative of this period of America. It's not libertarian or Randian or fiscally conservative. It's just plain old selfish and mean. Uh, I think that was pretty much the gist of a lot of commentary on the left. Does it, does it concern you, uh, even if you're not uh, you know, deeply far apart from your conservative colleagues, that this is being held up as something that could tar uh, the basic libertarian philosophy. Well, I, I, I think it is a problem. I mean, the, 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 the virtuous thing, the, the good thing about this is that it's a classic philosophy textbook, uh, you know, example, right? It's, a, it's something straight out of a of a philosophy 101 textbook. Here's a hypothetical or, situation. Or like a free speech amendment case fire in the crowd of theater kind of scenario. The right, exactly. Yeah. Case. Yeah, it's it's a and they say that you know interesting cases make bad law, and I think that that's something to be taken into account here. Tyler Cowen, uh, blogging at Marginal Revolution, said something I think good about this, uh, quoting um, some obscure theorist whose name I don't recall. But uh, the idea is that you know all regimes are going to have to, all political regimes are going to have to have have callous or morally repugnant rule sets in place to function well. Like you know you can't. You, you can't have a, a, the rule of law and a set of robust uh, laws and, and social mores that says, oh, if you were hungry, it's okay that you stole. 
um, you know, we can't, we can't build a system of laws on extreme cases and exceptions. And even though we'll find the results in those cases morally repugnant, we'll, we'll, all, we'll all feel sorry for the man who's sentenced to prison for stealing to feed his family, that that's not how you, you build, you know, legal regimes. And, I, and I, I totally take his point. And that's why my original argument about this case was, what does the human being on the ground do with a hose? Not, is there any wisdom in designing regimes this way? Because I tend to support these kind of libertarian regimes. Which brings me to the point about, you know, what the left is, uh, is doing with this case there. I think they're guilty of overextending sort of its consequences. It is an outlier case. It's not the sort of day-in, day-out uh, typical result of a regime like this. And the, the, the speedy go-to analogy here uh, was health care, universal health care. Chris Hayes on, on Olbermann was making the point that this is, this is an argument for single-payer health care. I mean, I don't think those, those cases are analogous. I was, a, a, I was a big opponent of Obamacare. I spent three months of my life blogging about nothing else. I don't think the cases are analogous. Um, uh, at all. Well, I mean, it may make an argument for the general concept of, uh, of of pooled insurance, or in some way, but you could say it makes the case for individual mandate just easily as, as specifically single payers or some type of um, universal system. Well, you know, I, I, the, the the big thing, and again, I, I really hope this isn't putting our viewers to sleep. But the big thing to me about fire is is that have you fire... watched Blogging Heads before? <laughs> <laughs> the, the the thing to me about 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 fire in this case is that it's closer to uh, air or national defense. These are classic examples of what economists call non-excludable public goods, and I think protection from fire is one of them. Healthcare. Not so much, unless we're talking about the you know the bubonic plague. I mean, if we were if we were to only you know let's say there was some huge outbreak of a virus, deadly virus, Ebola, pick what you like, in the United States, then it would be in our collective self-interest to inoculate everybody, right? We wouldn't worry about who had insurance and who didn't. But most healthcare is not like that at all. I mean, if you smoke, you're going to get lung cancer. Those costs shouldn't be socialized. You know, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm still, uh, and, and the vast majority of cases are just like that. And, and uh, you know, things like public safety, protection from fire, security, the enforcement of contracts, these are the bread and butter libertarian, these are the bread and butter things that libertarians believe the government should do. And, you know, my libertarian phase was something I dabbled in in college, like a lot of other people dabble in recreational drugs. Uh, I, would, I, would, I would now consider myself a libertarian-leaning, libertarian-sympathetic conservative, but I'm not, I'm not that hardcore of a libertarian. But I think in a lot of these cases, you know, we're not that far apart on, on these issues. But that's, what, that's the main difference to me is I think most health care decisions, most health care problems are not are not public goods in that way. They're not public in that way, period. And that there it's much more important to maintain a structure of personal responsibility uh, so that those costs aren't socialized with a lowercase s. <laughs> as, a, as a partial segue to our, our next topic, which is going to be the flop between uh, Joe Miller, the Alaskan Senate candidate, and, and uh, Todd Palin, uh, you, you mentioned that maybe liberals were overextending the argument, uh, but... Uh, it seems like there are a lot of Senate candidates like Joe Miller who are saying pretty absolutist things. You know, Joe Miller says right. that unemployment insurance is unconstitutional, and Medicare is unconstitutional, and Social Security is unconstitutional, uh, and electing senators uh, for, by the people should be unconstitutional by ripping the 17th Amendment. Um, I, is actually, it not I totally agree with him on that one. <laughs> that's, an that's an interesting topic, but... Uh, that yeah, that, but that was the downfall know. of the country, I agree. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, it, it would seem not not uh, out of line to say this is the type of vision a lot of these candidates seem to want to have for the country, does it not? Well, there's a big di I mean, there's a big difference between what these folks say as expressions of their principles and what's possible in the current institutional environment of the United States Senate. I mean, I think that uh, again, the big thing that not, not the thing that separates me from them on a lot of these issues. I think I would agree with Joe Miller on most of the things that you just said. The thing that separates us is probably just the pace at which we'd want to see those things change. I mean, I'm an old Edmund Burke graduate at heart, and I think that uh, we can't sort of radically transform this country into a libertarian utopia overnight, or a small, you know, or even a, a you know sort of 19th century version of America, small government version of America. Overnight, so I would agree with those things in principle. But I mean, I, I don't think anyone really has to worry about 
a kind of slash and burn government where uh, these old structures are overturned overnight. There's there's going to be 99 other senators besides uh, uh, Joe Miller uh, who, who are going to have a say in these things. So, I, I mean, insofar as it's interesting to talk about, I think, yeah, these guys are small government constitutionalists. They're not hiding it. I think that's to be commended. I agree with them on a lot of issues. Um, and it makes, you know, good fodder for conversation. But I, I wouldn't worry about a... a uh, drastic upheaval in, in the next year of, of the current size and scope of the welfare state. Now, one of the uh, you know, maybe less policy-minded uh, stories of uh, this election week, uh, interesting from a, from a blog perspective, uh, you had this kerfuffle between Joe Miller uh, in Alaska and Todd, uh, Sarah Palin's husband, Todd Palin, um, uh, Correct me if I, if I, if I have uh, my facts wrong, but okay. uh, Joe Miller was initially asked on TV if he would endorse Sarah Palin for president, and he kind of gave a, a roundabout answer, wouldn't answer it directly, saying there are lots of good candidates and stuff. Uh, this somehow got translated to Todd that he said she wasn't necessarily qualified. Todd fires off an angry email to Joe Miller and several... Uh, of his aides, and this uh, small email uh, email chain. I guess Joe Miller responds is basically saying, "Holy cow! I can't believe Todd Palin is you know uh, losing his mind over this." Holy cow is a direct quote, actually. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's something charming. The, the, there's something charming about a guy who uses "holy cow" <laughs> in personal emails. You know, I was. I, it always reminds me of a story. I, one of my good friends is just a a. a you know, mouth like a sailor, Italian stockbroker from Jersey. So he just has a really dirty mouth. And we were walking down a street in New York City one day, and we were crossing a street. We had the, we had the, the green light, and a cab, you know, zoomed up and missed us by about five inches. And my, my buddy turned to the cab and screamed at the top of his lung, "Hold your horses!" <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just, you know, it's, it's something charming about uh, uh, Joe Miller using "holy cow" in that situation. You'll get more attention in your city than actually swearing. <laughs> Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, sorry, I interrupted you. That's okay. Uh, so this email exchange ends up in the hands of an Alaskan blogger, uh, uh, Gene Devon at um, the Mud Flats, also gone by A.K. Muckraker. Right. Uh, her stuff's been on Huffington Post uh, a lot as well. Uh, she, she posts the PDF of the email exchange. She kind of half redacts the email addresses so she actually can still uncover them. Right. Um, so at least confirms the authenticity of the exchange, um, and so this blows up, and and Palin responds not by talking to a traditional media outlet, uh, but by feeding a short ex uh, statement to the Weekly Standard website. Right, that kind of um, and. Uh, well, I think there's a little more to the story than that, but just the, the whole thing essentially is, is existing in the, in, in the online world. Uh, and does this have any kind of implication uh, on the right as far as uh, how the Palins carry themselves? Does it feed this notion that they're kind of a, a constant circus and they can't just straight up and fly right and be seen as serious political material? Um or just just being dismissed as you know uh, a minor incident that will be forgotten in 24 hours. Well, I think insofar as I mean, we haven't spent at the at National Review Online, we haven't spent much time writing about it. I think it is muckraky, and it's not especially newsworthy. But insofar as it has been spoken about on the right, I mean, it's interesting, but I don't know that it's newsworthy. It, insofar as it has been talked about on the right blogosphere, it's it's been the standard. Um, here, here, here they go again. Here the mainstream media goes again. You know, exposing personal email addresses, uh, trumping up this story, trying to turn it into a story about Sarah Palin's presidential ambitions. Um, you know, so it's been it's been. And that there's line. a sense from the emails from Todd's email that makes very clear that she has presidential ambitions. That's sort of one of the interesting things about it that kind of uh, unveils that. Well, I don't know. You know, I don't know that I agree with that. I don't, I don't mean to to pick a nit here, but. I, if I if I had endorsed a candidate uh, and and was and felt that my endorsement was weighty and was wanted and desired, as Joe Miller surely wanted and desired Sarah Palin's endorsement, and then somebody asked, you know, uh, uh, the, the person I endorsed on national television whether or not I'd make a good president, and they 
hemmed and hawed, I'd just be offended whether or not I wanted to be president because, uh, you know, the, you, you want to think that your endorsement meant something because there's a respect, there's a, you know. Uh, so I think, you know, I don't think it necessarily means Sarah want, Palin wants to be president, although we might as well address this issue because that, I think, is the big upshot of, of this story, and that's why people in the blogosphere were interested in it because of that one, because of that suggestion uh, with Todd Palin getting upset about, uh, about Joe Miller's answer to that question. Um, you know, that's been the upshot. Oh, Sarah Palin really wants to be president. I think it's clear that Sarah Palin wouldn't mind being president. She said as much. I mean, she said if, 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 if I didn't think that there was anybody, you know, I'm paraphrasing here, but if I didn't think that there was anybody better qualified, if I was chosen, she's used that sort of language, if, if the duty fell to me, I would run for president 2012. But I think she knows exactly what's going on, which is that all the polling done uh, suggests that she's uh, very, very popular. Uh, with uh, a, a certain very broad block of, of voters on the right and center right, and very very unpopular with uh, the rest of the country, which uh, uh, leaves her somewhere between 35 and 40 percent most of the polls that I've seen as a potential uh, presidential candidate. And she knows that she's not going to win under those conditions, and she's playing wait and see. Uh, I don't think she's stupid. I don't think that she would run a an unwinnable, uh, you know, tilt at windmills campaign. And I also don't necessarily think she'd do something like run on a third party, although although who knows. So I think the answer to the question is she said that she would, that she she has presidential presidential ambitions. That's not a secret. She's not said that she's going to run because I don't think she knows that she's going to run. Uh, I think what you're saying is tracked by what Mark Amador wrote in a post, yeah. which was titled "Todd Wright Todd Palin was right to be angry." Uh, and he wrote, the Palins are thinking about a run for president. Sarah has admitted as much, no surprise. We are both Palins prize loyalty. Miller appeared to be acting disloyal. And Todd Palin, in a moment of anger, sent an email blasting for suggesting something he didn't suggest. Uh, more revealing than Palin's email is Miller's apparent disdain for Team Palin, which suggests that Miller and Palin don't really like each other, and that Palin's endorsement was predicated in part on her political strategy, that's how endorsements tend to work in American politics. Yeah. Um, he goes on to say, if Palin wants to be president, this is one hump she's going to have to overcome. Her net favorable ratings among Americans are currently a negative 30. You can't bomb and kill every leader who disses you. In time, self-confidence will bring less of a spastic response. But then again, if someone published your emails, particularly emails you sent in haste, wouldn't you be upset? Uh, she, he's referring to, to Palin, Sarah Palin's reaction to all this. Uh, and someone suggested, or appears to suggest, that your wife was not qualified to be president after she endorsed that someone. Uh, right. So I think that's sort of in line with what you're saying, too, correct? No, it's, it's exactly, uh, unfortunately, it's exactly what I said. Mark, <laughs> and Mark M. Binder, Mark M. Binder said it better. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think that's, I think that's right. And I, and I, and I think that, uh, you know, the, the, as you said, the statement that Todd Palin fed to the Weekly Standard was that, look, this is a non-story. We crossed our wires. There was a misunderstanding. Uh, and, and we're going to move on. But one of the things that M. Binder said that I think we need to uh, zero in on, uh, because, again, it's fun for us to, to write and talk about this, but we pretend as if this is not how political endorsements work in this country. If every, you know, I mean, if every politician uh, who endorsed, a, 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 you know, a, a candidate uh, had to have a chummy personal relationship with them and be bosom buddies, then there just wouldn't be any political endorsements to speak of uh you know well, i think it's not it's not unusual that people look at endorsements as as professional transactions what sort right. of strikes me is uh you know you can only you can only endorse one presidential candidate and presumably joe miller is going to be endorsed by lots of other potential presidential candidates granted palin was there first but they're from the right. home states that's not shocking um i wouldn't think it would be implicit that if I endorse you for Senate, then you must be endorsing me for president. Uh, that it's it's not usually that quid pro quo -y at the end of the day. Right, that's true. And you know, just I mean, just in terms of tactics, what Joe Miller could have done is said, "Yeah, I think Sarah Palin would be a great president." Presuming that he believes that, that would have been great. You know, it's two thousand ten. Uh, no, you know, his, his response was sort of generally odd, considering there, yeah. there there are lots of polite ways to answer that question without flat out endorsing. Yeah, and 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 the, and it's it's made more odd still because Miller is actually a, a very you know articulate guy, and he's he has got pretty good control uh, in interviews, unlike you know um, 
some other uh, candidates that have been having trouble with gaffes this cycle on both sides. So it was it was a little it was a little odd, and I don't want to pretend I know what's in his head. Uh, but it well, certainly you know, this is a follow up. You know, he was on Fox after the emails came out, mm -hmm. and he was at he was asked again. <laughs> Was there, well, not even again. I didn't, sort of, I didn't see this. The, the question was, well, is she qualified? And his response was sort of oddly um, technical. Well, she said, he says, we know what qualified means, don't we? We know that we have old. a constitutional requirement for someone that's going to run for president. Of course, she's qualified. Basically, she was born here and she's 35 years old. Uh, and uh, folks right. at Crooks and Liars, uh, David Neuert, said not only did he decline to endorse her again, he also had sort of an implicit uh, birther comment to say oh, that we, we oh, all know on. that you have to be born here to be president. Come I mean, on. That's, it's reading too much into it, but that's what was said. Yeah, Joe Miller's dog whistling to the birthers now. But I, but I will say that his response was spoken like a true Yale Law graduate. I mean, that was, that was a pure... <laughs> Pure technical, you know, technical. I mean, maybe he's keeping his options open if he thinks he's going to have some, to, to quote Sharon Angle, if he thinks he's going to have some juice in the Senate. Uh, and I do think I do think Joe Miller is going to going to win that race if he thinks that his endorsement might mean something in a couple, you know, in a, in a year, a year and a half. Then maybe uh, he is just trying to keep his options open. But I don't think it would have hurt him at all to say, "Yeah, I think Sarah Palin would make a fine president." You know, that's that does that's not tantamount to an endorsement. So it is odd. I don't know why he didn't say it, and I'm not going to speculate. <laughs> but I don't know why. Uh, what's blogging is for if not speculating? Right. Uh, there was another blog post. Uh, I think it was in the past week, uh, and I'm trying. It was at the New Republic, and I I try to remember if it was Jonathan Cohn or Jonathan Chait. Mm. Um, uh, I think it was Cohn. But basically talking about the difference between uh, Rand Paul uh, and another Tea Party favorite, you know, Sharon Angle, right. they both had their uh, their gaffes. Uh, but uh, he he was he was suggesting that the basis of Rand Paul's gaffes was that he is such a smart person and he can't resist not telling you how smart he is. Uh, and therefore, he gets what he take. He goes down paths that maybe a more restrained political candidate wouldn't go down. Is it possible Joe Miller is sort of in that same boat that uh, you know he's he's very confident um, and uh, he doesn't uh, he's not ducking the press the way some other candidates are, but he's giving these sort of overly literal answers and not kind of playing a little bit of the politics game because he is so convinced of how uh, things should ideally be in his. Uh, uh, it's a constitutionalist world. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's also the case that both those guys are, you know, this is their first time in the national spotlight, and they they both won more or less insurgent, you know, primary campaigns, and so they're not sort of steeped in and surrounded by, uh, you know, political fixers and message managers and communications directors and publicists and all those things. So so there's there's going to be a little bit less varnish on everything they say just naturally. I do think it's the case that both those guys are smart guys. And I do, and, and you know, it's also the case, as we know, that they have very small government constitutionalist uh, and libertarian-leaning views and, and sort of originalist uh, views on the Constitution, and they're not they're not trying to hide them. Um, I, you know, I don't know if they're being too. I, I think if I think if those guys are being too honest, then it says more about the state of electoral politics in the country than it does about those candidates. I mean, we should all be refreshed that these guys are honest and both and you know, and they both have, depending on which polls you look at, whether for instance Murkowski's included in in Alaska, they both have uh, leads, and I think that uh, and I think both those guys will probably uh, win. I think the Con the, the Conway. Paul matchup is a little bit closer, uh, although I haven't been looking too closely at that lately. In part because Rand Paul has gone completely, uh, you know, uh, media blackout on us. But you know, so I guess that would be my short answer: is that if if those guys are being too honest, then it's you know so much the worse for electoral politics. Fair enough. Um, another political development that that caught my eye, and admittedly, it, it didn't get that much blog attention. But still involves uh, online media, so I will throw it into the uh, the weekend blog mix. You had a couple of of YouTube uh, political ads, uh, one from Harry Reid's campaign and one from Terrell Clark, who is a the Democrat challenger challenging Michelle Bachman in Minnesota. Uh, so these are ads that were not designed for TV; they're clearly web only, right. uh, and both really you know push the envelope on. 
would be considered uh, appropriate political fare. Uh, the, the Terrell Clark one uh, starts off like a fairly traditional uh, uh, negative ad. Uh, Sharon Bachman stood with the big insurance companies and the like. Uh, and then the ad ends with uh, Michelle Bachman not doing bleep for the people of the 6th District, but doing more than her share for the special interest in Washington. They actually, you know, they have an actual bleep. What they are the have bleep, uh, what are the bleep rules for blocking for heads? A swear word in the ad. Yeah. Uh, and it's obviously designed to catch people's attention, to be forwarded. You know, they, they push it very hard on their Facebook page. Uh, and I, I don't necessarily know if they're trying to get a lot of mainstream media attention for it, or they're just trying to get uh, donations from progressives from across the country. But that ad got over 100,000 YouTube views in a matter of days. Yeah. Uh, where, and I saw there's certainly conservatives out there who were, were hitting it very hard. Uh, uh, Kubachi yep. uh, saying, stay classy, Terrell, Car T Terrell Clark. Uh, we've seen it with Sarah Palin, Christina O'Donnell, and Michelle Bachman. They drive liberals insane, but this really takes the cake. She went beyond the bounds of of decent language. Um, uh, I hate the media said Michelle Bachman's a poem that creates the worst blank in political commercial of the year. Uh, and maybe it is a bad ad at the end of the day. I, 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 I don't know how it's going to re react on the ground in Minnesota. Uh, but it seems like it wasn't that she went insane. It was a calculated choice to do something to grab attention when there's so many political ads out there and it's very hard to get your ad to stand out. Yeah. Well, I think that there's there's a lot to be said about. I think we'll look back at the the, the 2010 midterms as, if not a golden age for political advertisements, then some sort of you know some age. I don't know if gold is the right golden is the right adjective I'm there. Sure but, uh, that. This might actually be a golden age. <laughs> right, uh, but, but uh, the demon sheep age. It, that, exactly right. That's what I was going to say. Is that demon sheep early on in in, in the in, in the this election season set the tone for sort of wacky out there web-based, viral video targeted um, advertising. And, and and I think both of the read video you mentioned, which is in a lot of ways too. I mean, I think that the, 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 the anti, the, the hit ad on Bachman is, is, is interesting and perhaps over the line because it has that, that, that bleep board there. Although it's, you know, it's, it's going to get people's attention. And I don't, I don't, I don't know uh, that that there's necessarily going to create any kind of backlash. Although she's running six or seven points behind Bachman, but the the read ad is something different. We talked about this off air. Is that is that it? You know, it's it's odd that Harry Reid, you know, the entrenched incumbent, um, would would do something so risky. I mean, and would it's got weird low production values, and it's kind of all over the place, and it's not particularly well structured. Well, and and had, just to describe this, this is an ad narrated by Rita Rudner, who the, people might remember as a longtime stand-up comic and now is, is Vegas-based and is one of the more prominent, uh, you know, hotel shows there. Uh, and it's done as a, a in, in a cheesy infomercial style, right. Sharon Angle's Crazy Juice. Uh, and uh, and there's a lot of inside jokes in there. You really have to be watching Polly's yeah. very closely to get the references. Yes, that's true. And but, which, which said to me, this wasn't intended to be, you know, a, a carpet bomb down all across the state. It's trying to appeal to, um, you know, uh, political junkies uh, across the country. But you might see that a, a more likely strategy for Tara Clark. Here you are. You're you're a challenger. You're not hugely well financed. You're up against uh, uh, someone who has a lot of national support with conservatives across the country. What can you do to elevate yourself? You know, throw a long ball. Right. Reads in a very tight race. Um, I, I assume he's well financed. I don't. I wouldn't assume he's out of money. Um, right. So uh, I don't totally understand what the logic would be behind it, except that uh, anything you could do to keep the narrative that Sharon Angle is crazy, which is clearly what the overarching narrative of that campaign is. Um, uh, you could argue what push any front you can to maintain that narrative. Uh, so you, know, you could certainly say, you know, Harry Reid is, you know, a total nitwit to do this, or you could say Harry Reid is a mad genius, and he's Maybe, not afraid I to mean, take a risk, even though he is the Senate Majority Leader. Well, I mean, we'll see, we'll see, right? But I, my colleague uh, Jim Garrity, in his in his daily 
uh, newsletter today said something uh, pretty funny about about Harry Reid's the race that Harry Reid is running, which is that Plan A was coast to victory on the success of the stimulus bill and health care reform, and that was thrown out the window pretty quickly. And Plan B was to demonize Sharon Angle as crazy outside the mainstream uh, and, and and too extreme, which is this is sort of a, a bit from that playbook, but his more his more conventional attempts to do this and to paint Sharon Angle that way have not necessarily worked. And he's in, in the last two polls that I saw, he was two and four points behind uh, behind uh, Angle. And so you know, it's getting to the point now where well, even that's a success when your approval's in the thirties. Well, I get I guess, but that's I mean the most interesting thing about the I guess the CNN poll that came out yesterday, the day before, was. That you know you have at, on the ballot line as a, as a Nevada, you have a none of the above ballot line, which I right. which I think is uh, I think is great, and I wish I wish every state had that. And you know none of the above, is just in one poll, but in one poll three weeks out from the election, uh, is polling at ten percent. And the Tea Party, you know, it, whether he's real or or a fake Tea Party candidate out there, is polling at seven or eight percent. So you have, I mean, you have an incumbent Senate Majority Leader. Well financed, as you said, who's running at forty percent? You know, uh, in, in, in this race, I think he's getting desperate. So I think it's it might be closer to this is him throwing a, a hail mary than uh, than uh, than we than we initially thought. Um, I think he's yeah he's gonna he's gonna sort of you know throw everything he can up against the wall and see what sticks. Uh, I'll just just to close off the segment. I note that. His YouTube has only got about four thousand views, whereas the Charles Clark one got a hundred thousand. So, uh, the yeah. you know the cheap swearing got more traction. The one I think yes. was actually a more creative ad, which was using using Rita Rutner, um, but it didn't have quite it didn't have quite the same newsy value. You you could, you could run an ad saying Tarot Clark uses profanity in ad. That's a news headline. Right. Harry Reid uses a um, you know edgy comedic ad. Is not a succinct headline. Uh, right, didn't move right. as much viral, at least not yet. Right. It's. I mean, it's more calibrated, right, to be an internet meme. It's. You know. It's. It's. It's got a lot of, as you said, inside jokes and things tossed in there. It's more calibrated for the, for the, you know, for the YouTube uh, uh, generation and the YouTube demographic. But I, I don't know how that helps Harry Reid in Nevada. I don't know that his re-election hopes turn on uh, turning out, you know, twenty-something internet savvy. Irony junkies who who like the you know slap chop uh, infomercials and like to see good parodies on on silly infomercials. I don't think that that, that those that the demographic that's going to save them. So I don't. Well, really I, get I this. presume. I mean, I mean, Reed is running a campaign, which I mean, let's not pretend this is the only ad he's running. You know, he's got right, no, no, sure. He has a very broad uh, uh, campaign strategy, and when it's a close race like that, you want to squeeze at every demographic you can. I imagine. Right, and I mean, then this was presumably cheap. Although I don't know how much. I don't know if he paid Rita Rudner or not, but uh, it's just it's a it's a very odd it's an odd campaign season uh, via you know via ads via uh, you know in terms of who's funding these ads um, you know so everyone's coming out of the woodwork the five hundred one c threes and c fours are going nuts uh, it's a it's a very bizarre uh, cycle and we've, from Demon Sheep on we've just seen one weird ad after another people getting beat up at campaign rallies it's just you know it's a very I mean a very unusual cycle. And it's it, only three weeks left, uh, so it does, so at least we won't have to uh, put up with it too much longer. I, I find it wildly entertaining. I don't know what you're upset about. <laughs> no, I'm just a, I'm an old curmudgeon, man. I just, I want I, I can't wait for my Republican majority to, to get into the house and start start doing some governing. That's what I look forward to. <laughs> it's, it's, it's very high minded and responsible of you. <laughs> um, uh, so one last topic before um, we 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 call it a day. Um, uh, Bob Woodward is still on his book tour uh, for Obama's Wars. I actually know he's going to be, uh, or maybe he already has by the time this airs, uh, on Fire Dog Lake's book salon. Uh, Bob Woodward, never someone a huge, never had a lot of love from the liberal blogosphere, so I thought that was an interesting choice yeah. on both parts uh, to have him for their, their weekly book salon. Uh, but uh, Mark Amender, who we mentioned earlier, who blogs at The Atlantic, and I believe he's moving to the National Journal by the end of the year. Uh, really spearhead their, their their broadening political team. Uh, he took a real tough shot at Woodward, writing an essay uh, in the 
parody voice of Woodward, um, mocking a style for uh, mind reading the thoughts of others. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I said, I mean, really, he really, I mean, basically, Amber seemed to really take journalistic offense that Woodward was taking a bit of, of gossip, uh, not terribly well sourced, that Obama would replace Joe Biden with Hillary Clinton in, in 2012. Uh, and my pressure from Amber's piece was that he is. He felt he had plenty of actual reporting saying this was utterly ridiculous. It would never, it never, never happen. Right. Uh, and in the in the piece, uh, Amber writes again. This is in Bob Woodward's voice. Quote: I can't believe Woodward would say something like that. Amber told his editor Bob Cohn over coffee in Cohn's Watergate office the next day. Quote: He yeah, just he knows next to nothing about the president's actual relationship with his vice president and secretary of state, or that he's done no reporting the question at all, which is absurd because Woodward is a reporter's reporter. Then again, Amber thought privately, one of the senior policymakers who's played a starring role in Woodward's latest book had characterized its conclusions as, quote, 60% right and 40% completely wrong, unquote, and that was from a policymaker who came across favorably in the book. So right. he, he, he not only takes a shot at the at the Hillary nugget, but kind of takes a shot at the, the entire book. Yeah, the, well, there's, there's a few things to say about this. One is that I think that post was stylistically spot on. I mean, I thought that, that Mark nailed it uh, with just that tone. And there's, you know, there's a line about, about M. Bender taking a, a, a sip of his tepid water, you know. And, and and it's not just the Woodward books, you know. And maybe this is just professional jealousy. As a, as a matter of fact, I'm, I'm pretty sure that it is uh, professional <laughs> envy. But... But I mean, when I read when I read Woodward, when I read when I read uh, last year Sorkin's book Too Big to Fail on the financial meltdown, you, there are these little you know they tell you what the you know tell you what the 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 CFO of Merrill Lynch ate for dinner on Tuesday, uh, and that you know the pasta was undercooked, uh, you know, and the, all these this all this verisimilitude, these little details that, that that these journalistic accounts sneak in. Half the time you sit back and you think, well, how could you fact check that stuff? You know, so I, so I, I'm kind of conspiratorial. I'm always conspiratorial when I read these journalistic accounts where you're interviewing people a year after the fact, and you're trying to compile based on some some faces, you know, face to faces and some phone calls. You know, a very fine grained, finely textured account of of, of, of all this minutia. So I'm always a little suspicious about that. And with with Woodward, I mean, I think his books, you know. You know Whatever Woodward book comes out, everyone's got to read it, and they print the most, you know, the juiciest tidbits and on all the blogs, and then all the, they excerpt them in the Post and the Times, and you know, so it's, it's become this kind of seasonal event whenever he writes a new book, and, and Lord knows he, he writes a new one every year. But I, you know, I don't know. I guess I, I read bits and pieces of all the President's Men. I read the Brethren, which I like a lot, and I took a look at the the, the Bush books, uh, the, the last two Bush books especially, and. And I, and I I have my review copy of, of Obama's Wars, and I've taken a look through it. I mean, he's really, really good, but th but there is that question that he's just, you know, he's a one-man machine, and and nobody can, nobody's really checking up on his work. So Mark takes it one step further and suggests that, you know, this is just bald speculation, uh, you know, checking it against the historical record, uh, that this is just bad speculation. And, you know, it, it, might, it might be true. Uh, and, and who would know? Because it, it, it's exactly, as he said, he's Bob frickin' Woodward. You know, who's going to call him on it? <laughs> uh, I, I was impressed by Amber. I mean, Amber to turn this piece out, it would have to be within a day yeah. of Wood making the, the Hillary comment. Yeah. And well, you know, there's a lot, you know, we see this from the Times columnists a lot, particularly Tom Friedman and Maureen Dow, these 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 attempts to be funny by writing in the voice of somebody else. Yeah. And they're they're usually so painful. Terrible. Terrible. So forced. And so for Amber to kind of get the Woodward tone spot on on the fly, I thought was uh, I mean from from a from a stylistic standpoint fantastic. Right. But your point as far as, you know, substance of it, I mean I mean I, anyone who's been around as long as Woodward has, you might eventually have certain things catch up to him. Uh you know, one wonders if people might start to look at these books more skeptically if a post like this really, really, I, this just came out, uh, this post came out um, uh, yesterday, so I don't know if it's really gone super viral yet. Um, uh, you know, because basically the, there's been a knock on Woodward for a while that, you know, whoever talks to him the most gets the favorable treatment. Right. And therefore you're not really getting a true And whoever talks to him first. 
important. What's that? More, whoever talks to them first, right. almost as importantly, right? right? Because they set, they sort of set the contours for how he's going to interpret, you know, you know, counter narratives that come later down the road. The first, you know, the first depiction of of events is, you know, is always the one that you base revisions on. You know, so that's true. People are kind of there's, you know, stories about how high-powered officials in Washington are falling all over themselves to talk to Woodward first so that they can right. preempt what their political enemies are going to say and they can preemptively, you know, counter the charges that they think are going to be leveled at them and shape the narrative in their direction. Uh, yes, yeah, so, I mean, maybe that's true. And I, I, I will say, though, on the, the Tom Friedman score, I think you could make a whole cottage industry out of people trying to write like Tom Friedman, because I think that's a hilarious enterprise. But you're right, when, when Friedman does it the other way, uh, it, 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 often, uh, it often doesn't go over too well. And just one last thing on, on, on this. Uh, it, inside the blogosphere and just, you know, on Twitter and shooting around emails, uh, I was surprised, I guess, because it hasn't been something I've, you know, that, that's been a real topic of conversation in the circles I move in, but I was surprised by the number of uh, uh, folks, uh, reporters, bloggers on all sides of the political spectrum, on every end of the spectrum, uh, basically, you know, agreeing with uh, Mark and, you know, tipping their caps to him and saying that he was spot on with this. And I just didn't know that there was that well uh, of sentiment out there. Uh, so that was a little surprising to me. Very interesting. Well, perhaps sure. leave it on that note, sir. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bill. No problem. So uh, where can folks find your work? Well, you can go on National Review Online, uh, and I'm all over the place usually. Uh, the next couple of days I'm out on assignment, but uh, go on NRO and, uh, and read uh, copiously. Excellent. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm Bill Sheriff. Check out my interview with Matt Lewis uh, at liberaloasis.com uh, over the weekend. Um, it's been another great edition of the Weekend Blog, and we'll – We'll catch you next week on This Week in Blog. Take care. Bye.